the purpose of Wealth Talk is to educate, inform, and hopefully entertain you on the subject of building your wealth. Wealth Builders recommends you should always take independent financial, tax, or legal advice before making any decisions around your finances. Welcome to episode 129 of Wealth Talk. My name is Christian Rodwell, the membership director for Wealth Builders, and I'm joined today by our founder and my co-host, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Chris. Good morning to you. Nice to talk to you again. Yes. Yeah, so today we are focusing on risk and uh, specifically risk mitigation within a property strategy. And that strategy is commercial to residential. And our guest today is Mr. Martin Rapley, who has many, many years of experience working in this area. Well, Martin and his wife, Sarah, are just great people. And uh, you can tell he's an incredibly sharing guy and we're both proud and pleased that uh, he's a, a client of Wealth Builders as well. So we're very happy with that. And um, he's got some great lessons to share. And what I'd say about this particular podcast, actually, is although, you know, you just set it up there, almost like, you know, set it up high, ready to be knocked out of the property park. Actually, you know, I found seven lessons in there that have got nothing to do with property. So this is the thing, you know, whenever you're a, when you start to become a wealth builder, you, you're looking to, to make distinctions, tiny, tiny distinctions that are almost like chipping away the rock, that when you make and shine and hone those distinctions, you become smarter. And I think in truth, Chris, that's, you know, in this, what's happened with Martin, he's become a very, a, you know, accomplished man in his field. And I think as a wealth builder, We've become accomplished in our field and my ability to see um, and take lessons from other people and turn them into distinctions that you can use in your life, even if you never did a commercial to residential property conversion. So don't listen because it's property. If you're interested in property, it's going to be a great listen. But if you're not interested in property, don't hit the snooze button. Don't move on to the next one because there are seven little lessons in there embedded which I'll pull out at the end, but maybe there's a little challenge, you know, as you're listening to it. See if you can um, note any things that you think are fundamental lessons. If you've been following us for a while, and we're very grateful we've got a good following now, Chris, if you've been following us for a while, see if you can pick out at least one or two of the lessons um, because then it means you're listening with an intention rather than just listening to the content. How about that? Okay. All right. Notepads at the ready then. Let's head on to our conversation today with Martin Rapley. Martin, welcome to Wealth Talk today. Hello, Christian. It's really good to be here. Thanks very much for uh, getting in touch with me. Yeah, no, very welcome. And, uh, you know, we've known each other for for several years out on the uh, property circuit. uh, And uh, no, really nice to have you on the show today, Martin. And uh, we're talking today about managing risk in commercial to residential conversions. So, you know, Risk, obviously, very important area. You know, we have due diligence as a piece of our wheel of wealth. But I know in your opinion, there's too many investors that don't spend enough time considering the risks. And as a result of that, when things come up, they're a surprise and go into panic mode and they have to deal with it as an emergency rather than being a potential issue that could have just been on their radar if they'd have done a little bit more preparation and planning. So we're going to dive into some of these things today. And um, I guess, Martin, just to kick off, you know, what qualifies you as an expert in this area? What's your background and experience? So my construction experience goes back to 1985. I know I don't really look old enough for that, but that's when I left school. I worked for a building contractor initially as a quantity surveyor. That's the person who looks after the finances. Um, So worked for contractors for a number of years, drifted into more project management. I got involved with some lovely projects, mostly in London, where the logistics were as as complicated as the construction of the work. Um, You know, working in listed buildings, working in high security buildings, um, public buildings and things like that. So I got into, I drifted from finance to into whole project management. Um, I then ran my own construction business for a while. Um, and I found actually that most of my clients were property investors, and I thought, well, this is an interesting angle. I'd not really understood what property investors was then, although I'd had a flat for a number of years, but hadn't. It was just something we bought years ago, um, and so looked into working with property investors a bit more. Started to realise that I had huge amounts of knowledge that they didn't have, 
and that really there was no one supporting them. There was no one that they could ask that was reasonably independent, also thinking like a property investor. Um, and uh, and so in 2013, I wound up my construction business and became a consultant. Um, actually, went off and worked with a developer for a couple of years to learn the development side of things. Did some training in property investing and am now a property investor and a consultant for property investors. And everything I do is property investing, really. So that's what get got me here in a nutshell. Yeah, and and host of a property networking event, which uh, some of our listeners, I'm sure, will be very familiar with, uh, and, and you and your wife Sarah. That, that's right. Yeah, so we host Kent Pin Meeting. That's uh, going back into the live room after Christmas, which is really exciting. Um, so uh, yeah, back out there, and that's really just about uh, yeah, going meeting property investors, helping them, and being someone local that they can come to to understand more about the construction and refurbishment process. Um, rather than relying on what I see is some poor information that's out there on Facebook and yeah, ultimately learning from other people who have also learned, learned wrongly or learned poor methods because no one's been there to, to guide and support them. So we know there's obviously so many different uh, aspects of the property journey. And this is why we, I think we both love Wealth Dynamics, because it really points you in the right direction in terms of what are your natural skills and strengths and uh, who do you need to team up with? Who do you need in your life, part of your team, who can look out for the things that you're not so good at or you don't enjoy? And um, what's your Wealth Dynamic profile, Martin? So my profile is uh, a lord. Um, quite seriously, Lord. Um, you know, and, and in fact, I've got I've got no blaze in me at all. So um, yeah. So hence, I love a process, and hence I'm analytical. Um, if, if you looked at it, if you looked at it deeply, in fact, this was something that Roger Hamilton told me a long time ago that if you want to manage projects, if you want to be a project manager, whether that's in construction or in any field. The best profile is really an accumulator, so I'm only one removed from the ideal profile. But because I'm a quantity surveyor deep down with numbers, that's that kind of is what gets me over slightly onto the Lord side. Yeah, and of course we're focusing on the risk within commercial to residential today. But you know, it's a process which really applies to anything, right? Uh, absolutely. I've got a process that I teach my clients. Whether they're do, whether they're doing a small tidy up between some tenants, or they're doing something more ambitious, a house to HMO conversion, commercial to residential, or indeed it still is applicable if you you know you've got a a greenfield, a brownfield, and you're building you know ten new houses. The process it, it, it's the process that you follow. Part of the process says bring in the right team around you, and that's when you bring in the team that know about refurbishment or you bring in the team that know about new build you, you know, the builder that does new build isn't very good at refurbishment same with consultants as well so so the process says bring in the right team rather than look for a different process for every kind of project so when people ask ask me you know what what do I, what do I need to know you know for the project it's always like learn learn the process and then it will cover you for any kind of project you ever do there's a, I've only there's only two kinds of buildings I've never worked in. I've never worked in a, a prison, and I've never worked in a hotel. Otherwise, I've worked in every other kind of property I think we could ever have, in, you know, including police stations and banks and museums and you know, things like that. And actually, what you realise is it doesn't matter what you start with, what you finish with. The process pretty much stays the same in the middle. Okay. So before we start diving into to what some of that process is then, Martin, for someone who's listening now, who's maybe not 100% clear on what commercial to residential looks like, could you just give a few examples of, of what that might include, please? Yeah, I think, I mean, commercial to residential has been the buzzword or the buzz, buzz phrase for a number of years. It started off primarily being office space converted into residential. And when we're converting things into residential, we are typically talking about uh, flats, but sometimes they are uh, standalone houses, and it isn't impossible, obviously, to convert it into HMOs as well. So, um, so it started off being offices with the opening up of the the planning legislation, and and it's a continual moving thing at the moment. There's now opportunity to convert any kind of commercial building. So, the thing we're seeing a lot of are things like banks, 
we're getting a lot of um, B-grade shops you know, off the main high streets that we're converting now, um, as well as obviously offices. But it's now not quite as difficult to convert things like mechanics, um, you know, depots and um, you know, garages and things like that. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, even industrial, industrial that's within the centre of the town, not necessarily out on the industrial estates, but it's not impossible to convert industrial. And then on a bit of a tangent, even things like barn conversions really is still you know, a commercial use that's being converted into residential. So really it sweeps up any other kind, any, you know, anything that isn't a house really, um, you know, it starts off. And, and, and the difference is that every single property starts off in a different state. Something that's an office that where a company is literally just you know, moved out, you've got a building that's potentially in really good condition that needs bringing up to standards as far as residential standards go, but, you know, won't, isn't necessarily a massive job. Whereas if you take the extreme, perhaps an industrial unit or a barn, there's they're, they're clearly not buildings you can even necessarily sit in for a few hours without getting freezing cold. They, they haven't got insulation. They haven't necessarily got, um, yeah, sometimes not even fully waterproof. Um, so you've, you've got a much bigger process to bring them forward. But the process is where well, we bring in a consultant, normally an architect, that knows the regulations that we need to comply with to bring it forwards. They do some drawings for us. And from there, we then approach builders that can follow those drawings, follow the schedule of works and carry out what we need carrying out. So, yeah, hence I say it's, a, it's the process. The process is is pretty much the same. But it's, yeah, any building can be converted to residential. Subject, In fact, it's really subject to planning and subject to understanding the cost and the cost you know, stacking up as far as as, as evaluation goes. Mm. And in, in your opinion and experience, Martin, would you say that commercial to residential can be something that anybody could do without any previous experience as long as they had the right team around them? Or would you say that they, you know, best starting with something more simple to begin with? Uh, I think if, if they're going to, if they're going to manage things themselves, then start fairly small and grow into it. If they're of the of the of the mindset that actually, you know, I've got this big office block that I can convert into 20 flats, I have never done it before, therefore I need to bring in the right team around me and you know, literally sit on the periphery, then they can do that as well. Where I see property investors making a mistake is that they they want to be hands-on managing things and they're leaping straight into something that's of, of, of size without the wherewithal and the awareness of what they should be taking on as project managers. Um, yeah, project management is one, one of those businesses, one of those careers where in many ways people are almost saying, well, what are you doing? If someone's saying to me, what are you doing? That pretty much means that I'm making it all run smoothly because they're not seeing me panicking and running around. Um, and where I see property investors going is they, can't, they, they say, oh, well, I can manage this. You know, I've managed something in the past. I know how to manage. But, of course, they don't understand the technicalities of managing construction projects and what each other party brings to the, the table and what questions they should be asking them. So, so, some of the, so some of the best developers out there literally have said, never done it before, don't know what I'm doing, I need someone to make it happen. And they come to people like me as a project manager and then I help assemble the team or you know, they bring in other people. And I think that that's it. it goes, so by all means, go straight in at a high level, but expect to outsource the lot. If you want to get involved hands on yourself, then go incrementally from the bottom. And what are some of the, the most common mistakes that you see people making when it comes to commercial to residential, Martin? Wow. Um, so I think the first, the, the first mistake a lot of people make is actually not doing a thorough enough appraisal in the first place. So. So either not understanding enough about the property that they're building in the uh, sorry buying in the first place, which sometimes is lack of experience, just not knowing how deep to look. But sometimes is well, I didn't want to get a structural engineer to look at that structural crack in the back wall because it was going to cost me money, and then of course that turns out to be a major problem that needs to be dealt with later on. It's that you know, it's that kind of 
small mentality almost. I don't want to spend money in case I don't, it doesn't go ahead. So doing that appraisal thoroughly and doing a proper due diligence um, on, on what you're going to develop and being totally clear what you're going to produce um, and not expecting to be able to smash the market in your area you know, a flat sell at £150,000, don't think you're going to sell yours for £180,000 because you, that is just inflating the figures to prove a deal. And I see so many property investors that are just, they just fill the figures to prove there's a deal in it. And it will come back and bite them further down the line. And I've, you know, I've seen and I've heard and I've been part of some horror stories where investors have just fiddled the numbers or got um, yeah, got overexcited about what they can actually achieve. As a result, they bought property at the wrong price. Yeah, ultimately, you can't really change the sale price. If flats in your area sell for one hundred and fifty thousand, you might sell yours for one hundred and fifty-five as brand new, but you're not going to massively distort the market there. The cost of doing the conversion is pretty much fixed. You're going to tender that out to some builders. They're going to give you a quote for that. Therefore, the only figure that can, you've really got any control on is the purchase price. Therefore, work from the back end. I know what I can sell it for. I know what it's going to cost me to get there. I know what profit I want. Therefore, the figure that's left must be the purchase price. And I don't. And property investors don't do that. Property investors, too many property investors say, "Well, it's on the market for two hundred grand. I've done. I've knocked them down to one hundred and eighty. We're ready to go." Not. Well, I'm going to sell it for this. It's going to cost me this. What is it? Oh, I should only be offering 150 tops. That's the figure to start from. Um, so that's really the biggest mistake is, yeah, actually getting the wrong property or getting the wrong property at the wrong price in the first place is the, the biggest mistake I see property investors making. Starting with the end in mind, which is uh, often often what comes up. Yeah, that's exactly what everyone would tell you in anything. that They would tell you that. But yeah, it applies to this as well. Now, what about the planning situation, Martin? What are some of the things that might crop up there? So planning is a, is a massive risk. We've got um, massive relaxation of planning legislation uh, to a prior approval system. A lot of people will call it permitted development. It's not permitted development. We've got a prior approval system, and it is perfectly possible to tick the salient boxes and get projects through under that prior approval system. That effectively says you've got to submit a planning application, but to all intents and purposes, as long as you tick the boxes, it can't be refused. Now, the biggest risk in here is that it, it's a little bit subjective. You've got to interpret the legislation. The planners interpret the legislation. There can be some grey areas in there. There are grey areas because this is new legislation, and so it's a moving feast at the moment to some extent. But, but the other risk is that what you actually want to end up creating isn't quite prior approval because as part of the work, you really need to do an extension or you really need to reconfigure the front facade because the door is just not in the right place and we've got to get rid of these windows. And it's things like that that then start to fall outside prior approval. And as we were talking about, it adds more risk. We've got something that was reasonably low risk suddenly now comes up and becomes a slightly higher risk because the planners may not accept that change. Now, of course, if you can secure the property without planning, uh, you know, maybe get an option on the property subject to planning um, or, or, or things like that, that's where you can then start to eliminate that risk again. But really, you know, I would say to anyone, until you have got that planning um, decision notice in front of you, you haven't massively reduced the risk. And even with a planning decision notice, you can still have some conditions on it that still keep risk in the deal. Um, and until you've discharged the salient ones of those, particularly things relating to perhaps yeah, uh, environmental issues, noise concerns and yeah, pollution, traffic pollution, things like that, it's only after you've eliminated those have you really taken away the risk of the planning side of, of the deal. So, yeah, and again, this comes down this comes down to that original appraisal. Do the appraisal be clear what the risks are of getting planning, and and focus on 
you know, getting rid of those biggest risks first. And would you recommend, in terms of a contingency, so things will always or most likely always crop up, having some kind of contingency, some buffer, is there some recommended uh, way of people calculating that, Martin? Well, so if we come to construction side of things, I would tend to say a 10% contingency minimum, 10% of build cost minimum, possibly 15% um, on some unknown kinds of projects and higher if it's a listed building. The, the, the challenge is saying what is the risk of something that we haven't even started building yet? What, how do we add in additional cost for managing risk early on? Uh, where I, what I would say is, if you're putting in a planning application, consider every element where there is potential risk. The planners may not accept that this is not a flood zone. The planners may not accept that this modification is within uh, prior approval. The planners may not accept that this building is in an area that can be developed. So consider all of these, these risks and then look at what is the biggest risk in there. And this comes down to how we manage risks. You're, you're going to have risks all the way through any kind of development. You wouldn't worry about some of the risks in the early days. You would look at the, the, the big risks in front of you. But look at any risk, and you want to get rid of the biggest risk at, at, at first to the extent that some risks, until they're gone, you wouldn't even proceed with the deal. Some of these risks you wouldn't necessarily even put in an offer to purchase until you understand what the risk is. Um, for instance, if the building's structurally unsound, until you've got a structural engineer's report, you don't know whether you are converting it or actually demolishing it. Um, and, and so that potentially is your biggest risk. There's no point in making an offer to convert this building when actually a structural engineer would say it can't be converted. It is beyond the end of its life. It needs to be needs to be pulled down. And it might be at that stage you say, well, actually, this isn't even a deal for me. I don't even want to do new build. I only want to do conversion. So you, you move on. So the way I encourage anyone to consider risks is you consider every risk from two perspectives. The first is the perspective is what is the impact of this going wrong? So we've got this potentially structurally unsafe building. What is the impact on the deal? Well, the impact is if it is structurally unsafe, I don't want to buy the building in the first place. So that's quite a high impact, really. So score every impact one to five, five high, one low. And then consider what is the, if this worst case happens, what is the impact on me doing the deal? What is the impact on the whole deal? And again, one low, five high. So, so if it needs pulling down, I don't want to do the job. So that's five times five, 25. Therefore, that is something we've got to eliminate straight away. Whereas if it needs pulling down five, but I don't mind either way, five times one, that's now a much lower risk. And something else might be a higher risk that needs dealing with first. And what, what I see, a lot of property investors, they, they don't look at risk from that basis. They look at it from, oh, this looks a bit scary. I'll talk to someone about it. Whereas actually there's something else over here that's even more concerning and really they should be spending their money on first because, you know, yes, you might have to spend some money getting a structural engineer to give you a report in the case I'm talking about, but for £1,000, £1,500, you know exactly whether you're going to go ahead with the, with the deal or not. Rather than buy it, we've now bought it and now it's someone saying, well, you've got to put it down. You're saying, well, I don't want to do this and you've spent money buying something you don't actually want or actually now it doesn't stack up because it doesn't work if we've got to put it down. It only works if we can convert it. So that's how I would encourage anyone to manage risk. Look for, look for anything where you've got uncertainty and then score it. If, it's, if that scores over 10, it wants more investigation. The higher it is, the, the higher up your priority list it wants to be. Yeah, it's a really good tip. Thanks for that, Martin. And I think, you know, hopefully we're clearly showing here the importance of having the right people around you because there's simply so many different things that, as you say, you know, you cannot plan for. Sometimes things just come up along the way and it's experience, isn't it? I mean, only by doing this do you start to understand and realise what, what could happen. Uh, that's it. And the go, so going back to your previous question is how big a project can you do, you know, as a first off? 
if you've got the experienced team around you, then they're going to be flagging up these risks to you. If it's all falling on your shoulders, then you know it's about it comes down to experience. Where a lot of what I'm talking about is only experience. I've seen so many projects in my career of different kinds of buildings that I know a huge amount of the risks. Do I know all of them? Absolutely not. You know, there's things that come out of the woodwork here, there, and everywhere all of the time that I've, I've seen to some extent, but not exactly the same. I've not done a massive amount of new build of estates more than, in fact, I don't think I've ever built an estate, uh, more than four houses in any development. So I would say if someone came to me and said, Martin, give me some support to build these 20 houses, I'd be saying, well, I can give you some guidance, but it's not my core skill. My core skill is actually refurbishment and small developments. That's what I know a lot about. Um, and, and I've got some quirky little tangents I've been off on in my career. But, you know, again, the process says if you want to build 10 houses, bring in a team that have got experience of building 10, 20, 30 houses, um, and, and you know, the, they will give you the, expert, you know, the expertise. I've got you know, some of those skills, but not all of them. And different challenges come up at different stages. Yeah, and if, if someone doesn't really have that team, what would be your advice for finding the right people? Obviously, you know, good networking events like we, you know, we both know. But uh, you know, any other tips for for someone to know who the right people are? Uh, ultimately, you can't beat starting off on social media nowadays to get recommendations and referrals. Start on social media. The thing I say to anyone is, you must do your due diligence. Just because someone you know or you might be acquainted with on social media has recommended someone doesn't necessarily mean they are the best. It might be they were great for them, but your project's significantly different, so you, they may not be ideal. So you must do your due diligence, but there's no harm in starting with social media because you can very quickly end up with a short list of six or eight you know, consultants, six or eight architects, and then you can do some, you know, some due diligence and research catch up with them, see if they are going to be appropriate for you. But I think, you know, I say to anyone, people ask me, how do I find builders? And I say, you can't beat getting on social media. But just because they were a good builder for someone else doesn't necessarily mean they're right for you. And it's the same with architects, structural engineers, project managers, quantity surveyors. You know, use them as a short list, but dig deep and make sure that they are going to be the right people for you. Yeah, great. And I feel like we've just scratched the surface really on, on things today, Martin, but I know you've got an entire project management blueprint, which has got 74 different checklists, soon to be 75, I think. But um, tell, <laughs> tell, tell, tell us briefly a little bit more about the support that you offer and, and how that works. Yeah, so so as a, as a project manager, but also as a property investor, I've kind of learned and now over the last nine years or so how to present what I know, what, you know, everything that's in my head, I've got now in a format that is easy to present to property investors that are less experienced than me. Um, so, so I've got that in a, in a number of different ways. I've got a lot of online training courses um, where, where you know, literally subscribe to all of my training courses and then just watch all the videos back. Um, I, I've got, I do online Q&A, live Q&A generally most Friday mornings for my clients. Um, and then I've got an academy for property investors that want to be managing their own project, but actually want me holding their hands. And that includes you know, you know, one to one um, you know, live access to me and uh, you know, that, kind, that kind of thing. Plus, I do budgets and feasibilities. Um, I do contract documents. I do tender impacts. I do quantity surveying, contract administration, project management, kind of anything. The, the, the common denominator is all my clients are property investors or small developers, really. Um, and they're really just there, you know, even, even for the want of a free telephone call with me, you know, just to get a steer that a property investor understands what they're taking on. Because it's so, for, for me, some of the challenges I see property investors having are so easy for me to just say, just do this or just phone this person or just look at this website. Um, and, and they're off and running and, and, and flying. I've just got, you know, I've just got this knowledge that, you know, I didn't realise it was specialist knowledge until I came out of, you know, where I was in construction and realised that there's a whole bunch of people dying out for this specialist knowledge I've got, and I just want to share it with people, really. So, yeah. 
get in touch with you is, is the answer. Great. Building that IP pillar now as well. So, uh, well, and, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and where, where can people go, Martin? Where's the, the website, the URL for them to visit? Yeah, so the easiest way to get hold of me is go to uh, www.refurbishmentmastery.com. Um, there's a link at the top. It says book a call. You can literally go straight in there, book the free 20-minute call with me or go straight in and book a paid call with me. Um, have a look at Refurbishment Mastery on YouTube um, and on Facebook. I'm on Facebook, of course, as well. Um, I'm sharing stuff all of the time. Most of it has got a slant for refurbishment and conversion. As I say, I do a bit of new build, but that's not my real skill. Love conversion. So commercial to residential, it's got my name all over it. That's the bit I really love. Um, so, uh, yeah, get in touch and uh, let's have a chat and see if we can we can work with each other. Martin, thanks so much for sharing everything with us today. That's all right. It's been really good, good speaking to you. So, uh, yeah, look forward to catching up with some of your members in due course. Okay, let's see if your notes match up with ours then Kevin so um, yeah some lots of good lessons there for Martin and uh, many parallels with the whole wealth building journey so before we dive in let's have a quick look at Trustpilot this week and uh, pull out a couple of reviews and the first one I can see is from Helen and Helen says huge success in just one year so joined wealth builders a year ago with their support I've started a business which is now generating almost as much as my day job wonderful personalized support and Christian and co are happy to bespoke their service to members as the time goes on so congrats to Helen there she is absolutely doing a fantastic job and uh, another quick one, actually, from Daniel, who said, expert help every step of the way, couldn't fault their service or knowledge, expert guidance and advice every step of the way when setting up my SaaS. Okay, good. All right. Well, very interesting. It's interesting that, uh, see, we've now changed the name of Wealth Builders to Christian & Co. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, I've certainly had a couple of extra sessions with Helen, so I appreciate her uh, yeah, uh, acknowledging that support. Oh, it's, yeah. it's nice indeed. Uh, well, good stuff, but um, let's dive into the lessons, right? I found seven. Okay. So go on, Chris. Come on. You, you you spotted one straight off. It was one of the very first questions you asked Martin. Well, you know, always Wealth Dynamics is uh, a key part of anybody's wealth building journey because you need to know what your entrepreneurial compass is, which things you should be focusing on to get the best out of your strengths. And, uh, and yeah, Martin clearly is a strong, steely guy and hence the processes and the systems that he is so good at putting in place. You're absolutely right. I mean, you have to know your wealth dynamic because your wealth dynamic gives you a clue, not just as you say, you know, to, to your own true north of where your wealth should be headed, but but also how you're going to build other people around you. Because wealth is a, a whole experience of 360 degrees worth of knowledge. And we know this through the wheel of wealth of education, support, connection, due diligence, uh, all before action. And that 360 means you need lots of different perspectives and not just your own perspective because the big danger in wealth building is if you see life through a single lens you you really are going to be looking through a tunnel you know you'll never really see peripherally what else you can do what you can learn what what mistakes to avoid from others so knowing your wealth dynamic not just knowing your wealth dynamic but knowing also how you connect and collaborate with others to bring the most out of other people's wealth dynamics and We've done episodes on this before, uh, right at the very beginning of the podcast, Chris, haven't we? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wealth Dynamics. Yeah, I think that was episode, oh, certainly in the first 10, first 10 episodes. We'll link to it in today's show notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's one. Shall, shall I go next? Well, I mean, if I zoom out and just think the whole wealth building roadmap that we teach our members is all about following a process. And, um, you know, I think just having a clear process from where you are now to where you want to get to is, is a key point as well. Yeah, unquestionably the, the case, you know, that um, if you're following a process and Martin kept talking about process, 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 and, and we have a process and I alluded to it a moment ago, which is definitely a lesson, which is, you know, you, if you follow the process of education, you know, taking some time to learn a bit about the strategy that you're uh, looking to engage in, support that sort of impartial uh, help from somebody that it might take you some time, but you, you, you build trust so that they can both ask good questions of you now, but also help you ask better questions of yourself. And then uh, connection. So who else is in your life and more about that as a lesson in a moment. 
And then due diligence, which is the essence of really what Mar um, Martin's talking about here, is due diligence should be taken always before action. What Martin was saying, if you heard him, is people took the action and then made their due diligence fit the action. You know, they retrofitted the answer, uh, wearing the rose-tinted spectacles, as people often do, um, to create the solution that backed up the evidence that they were looking for. Instead of, as you said, and I think you did it well, Chris, begin with the end in mind, which is, you know, as Martin was saying, is, well, look, if you, if you, if you know what the end result will be and you know what the costs will be, you know what the profit you want to make will be, then you absolutely know what the purchase price needs to be. Not, it, I bought it, now I'll try and make the numbers fit. So, so I think following a process and always due diligence before action, and that's particularly poignant um, and relevant for all wealth dynamics because we all do due diligence in different ways, don't we? And um, and that's important. So, you know, Martin would be would be focused on the steely part of that due diligence, wouldn't he? Um, as a lord, but other people, creators and stars and and others like that, will be probably more likely to make a mistake based on their gut instinct and and how they feel, as opposed to getting the evidence to back up those feelings. So, uh, yeah, following a good process, Chris, is lesson number two. Yeah. Now, one of our still most popular episodes was episode number two, where we talked about the three Ds, and uh, that's whether you're a drifter, DIYer, or a dynamic. And uh, I think there were some lessons here from Martin about people trying to DIY it. Well, you know, there's always that, isn't it? And and I think the lesson in there is there's two lessons actually I'll bring out, Chris. One is, uh, and again, subtly Martin said it, and and I think let me give you the what he said, and then give you the lesson. He said a lot of people look at doing these sorts of projects, and they'll start off with the intention simply to cut costs. You know, they won't pay for a survey. They won't pay for an architect. They won't, they won't, they won't. And and the reason they won't is because they think they know more than they do. And this is true of, of anybody who's taking on board something they've never done before. There's this danger, isn't there, of, of really just thinking about the DIY mentality, the three most expensive words in wealth building. Do it yourself. Not good, absolutely not good, and and this point about being expense focused rather than results focused. The lesson I bring out there is scarcity versus abundance. See so if you if you start your wealth building life as if you know that you're coming from a place to create financial independence for you and abundance in the future as well. But also, you know that on that journey, you're going to be building relationships, enriching other people because you can't do these things on your own. It's impossible to do a project like this on your own. You can't just get a big toolbox and a, a generator to fire up every tool you could, you know, you could power because you run out of battery because you're going to need the saws, the hammers, the, the scaffolding, the you just simply couldn't do that. You couldn't imagine building and doing a, a, a commercial to residential project and doing every job on your own. You can't do it. So this scarcity versus abundance. And recognize that in this circular, circular economy of you helping yourself and you're helping your end result, you're helping the people who are going to be contractors and supporters for you along the way, that the profit that you're making for everybody is important in the abundance thinking, right? So it isn't about how do I keep things cheap, cheap, cheap. It's how do I expand my way into wealth? So that's the difference between scarcity and abundance. And the other thing that I think is relevant, Chris, as you talk about DIY, is, you know, the, the whole principle of the opposite of DIY is trusting in a community. It's actually finding that you can get more joy, more uh, profit, more um, satisfaction, less risk, all of those things, you know, multiple, multiple things by involving and investing yourself in a community of people, like-minded people on a similar journey to you. And you'll hear from 
so many people on these podcasts, how giving and sharing of their knowledge that they are. It's not solely driven from a profit motive. You heard Martin say that. I just want to help people understand this. He doesn't want people to make mistakes. And he will give knowledge and he shares that knowledge in his uh, networking meetings um, you know, as well so that he's wanting to be generous with his time. Yes, of course he wants to make a commercial value. And who doesn't? We all, we all have to live. But that uh, generosity of community is something I would ask anybody to get involved with and join a community. Whatever your wealth dynamic is, I mean, Martin said he's zero blaze, which means, well, no people energy in terms of the scoring on wealth dynamics. But of course, he pushes himself through that with himself and his wife because he's determined to help people and determined to, to help people avoid mistakes. So community versus DIY is the next lesson. All right. And what was the next point that you picked up on then, Kevin? Well, the next one is, a, again, a continuation, as most of these things are, is the point that Martin was making is people don't know what questions to ask. So, you know, they think they know enough, but they don't know enough. But because they don't know enough, they don't know who to ask. Now, we know this, Chris, in the principle um, extolled and, and, and spoken of eloquently by um, in a book which is called Who Not How. Uh, who not how. So we know the the other end of a how problem. How do I do a conversion? How do I work with listed buildings? How do I, you know, change the the heating from you know gas to uh, electric or whatever it would be for a, a more sustainable property? You don't know, but somebody else does. And in Dan Sullivan's book, which talks about who not how. This is the principle of always looking out to find in either your little black book that you build over time or, or tap into somebody else's bigger black book, like Wealth Builder Black Book. Mine's pretty big, Chris, isn't it? Then, you know, and Martin's will be big in his uh, particular field. They're willing to share their little black book with you, again, back to the community. But in the, as long as you understand, there's always a who who knows the answer. You do not have to discover the answer through the trials and tribulations of doing everything by trial and error, making mistakes financially, emotionally. You know, if you make big mistakes uh, with these sorts of projects, you don't just go backwards. It could, it could ruin you forever. You know, I've seen people make mistakes. I've heard people make mistakes in the millions, you know, and how do you recover from that, Chris? Yeah. And who not how such a great book. I'll definitely link to that one in the show notes so uh, people can check that out if they'd like to. Yeah. Well, I know there's a, there's definitely a wealth building pillar that Martin is, is, you know, starting to move into now, but it's, it's pillar number seven. So perhaps there's a few lessons that come before we touch on that one, Kevin. Well, creating IP is, uh, is, is obviously a, an important lesson, but of course you've got to do it in the right order. I see a lot of people think about creating IP first and you can't, you've got to create the value first. You look at the experience Martin's got, you know, you create the value, you get the experience, you get a proven concept, you make some money, you've got regular sales, you've got regular proof that what you're doing works. And then when you've got that, you can create the authority. You can't just create it because you hope people will buy it. And I see people in the wealth building community trying to create their IP First, well, you've got to create the value first and the IP would follow. And, and so the lesson that I want to pick out there, Chris, is you must be able to create value. And when you talk about Martin's projects, where did he say you create all the value? Well, you really create all the value by buying well, you know, because the only thing you can really control because costs are going to be out of your um, direct control, you'll be a, a broad range of costs, of course, but but the costings and the and the, the the final sale value. So you have to be an agent of value creation. So this is where I think I hear people say, "Oh, you can't make money in a rising stock market, or you can't re- make money in a inflated property market." Well, yes, you can because everywhere you look, there are pockets of value that you can create. And this one is a particularly strong one because if you think about the creation of value, you're forcing appreciation from something you buy at one level and convert it to something else, which immediately increases the value. 
Well, let's say for the simple argument that the value of a commercial property, and I'll, I'll just use round numbers just for the sake of illustration, not to say these numbers are real in any way, Chris, but, but let's say you know, you're buying a piece of commercial property and you know, the pounds per foot was £100 a foot, right, square foot. And, and if you're selling it ultimately to residential, which is £150 per foot, then you've got an increase of 50%. Do you see what I mean? So you have to understand that fundamentally residential property sells for more than commercial property. So there's a huge value creation. So you only need one project. So you can always find pockets of value because you only need one. You might not begin generating cash flow, but you'll be generating quite significant contributions of capital, which you can then either reinvest for cash flow, or you could do a big enough project, uh, whether it's a small or big one, you could keep some of the assets so you get a combination of both. So there's so many ways to be a value creator. And that was my lesson there, Chris, is just learn how to create value and understand you can create value in any market. And you don't wait for markets to change. That's not wealth building. That's you know, and that's just sort of bowing to and listening to the whims of a marketplace, which is not a way to build wealth. That's a way to uh, to absolutely stay um, not in the five percent of people who make it. So I think the, the the big overall lesson from the conversation today is, and and for wealth building in general, is that you can't eliminate risk, but you can certainly manage it. Have the have we missed any anything out at all, Kevin? I think we probably covered them all, Chris. I mean, the I think the the one other point I probably would make is, um, which again, there's so many overlaps here, is so many people look at property in this area as almost like um, they do the numbers personally, you know. So it's like, uh, I, I'd like this property, you know, personally, I like the look of it, I like the feel of it, or I like the idea of doing it, instead of looking at it from a, from a numbers perspective. So it's important that, that you see wealth as a business uh, where the numbers have to stack up and not just as how do I feel personally about doing this one thing. Nothing wrong with getting personal satisfaction from it, but not at the cost of making a mistake. That means you're putting time, energy, and money into something that makes you no money or, which sometimes happens, actually loses you money. So nothing wrong with actually gaining a lesson if you lose money, but we wouldn't start from that angle to say, just do anything you can to learn a lesson you know, get that, you know, community involved, find somebody you trust, find somebody like a Martin, get yourself out there, networking with style, uh, building your own little black book and start to do it now. Just buy yourself a little black book and start to add people in all different areas where you need them in wealth and start to build that and find out other people who are strong in areas where you are weak. I think we got lots of lessons from Martin today. Yeah, I think so too. So uh, thank you, Martin, again, for sharing all of your wisdom and insights with us. And uh, we hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. If so, please share it with a friend. And Kevin, we'll catch up same time, same place next week. I look forward to that, Chris. And until next time, my friend, see ya. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget that we are constantly updating our resources inside the Wealth Builders membership site to help you create, build and protect your wealth. Head over to wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership right now for free access. That's wealthbuilders.co.uk slash membership.